Good morning. Welcome once again to our worship time at the Village Church of Christ. I want to again begin with a statement that is being made by our shepherds and encourage you to listen very closely. Our shepherds continue to monitor very closely the events around the world and within our own country and community regarding the impact of this pandemic. Their biggest concern has been, and it continues to be, for this congregation of God's people. We have a large number of our membership that falls into the most vulnerable category. And so because of that, we will not be rushing into any decision to return to assembling in large numbers. The information obtained from the federal and state level will certainly be taken into consideration, but the overall welfare of this flock will drive what decisions our elders make regarding our assemblies. You will be kept informed as things continue to unfold. Until then, you are encouraged to assemble together via these YouTube streamings of our Sunday morning times, our Sunday evening connection group lessons with Tom, and our Wednesday evening devotional times with Chad. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we are just blessed to be your children. We're blessed to be your people. We know, Father, that you are uh, among us. You are watching over us. And you have a love that you have displayed in so many remarkable ways from creation itself to the providing of your word to the establishment of the church to the precious gift of your son to calling us together on these first day of the week to be able to remember that sacrifice and remember that love. And so, Father, I pray you'll be with us again this morning as we do just that. Thank you for Jesus, and it's through him we pray. Amen. Let's share the Lord together this morning. We gather here in Jesus' name. His love is burning in our hearts like living Um 
Good morning. And yes, we are in the midst of struggle and we uh, do have a measure of fear and this is quite a unique situation that we find ourselves in. But isn't it true that Jesus told us that in this world, we will have trouble. When people are in trouble and are struggling and have a measure of fear, it's common for us to look for something that's uplifting, something that makes us feel better, a victory. Peace. I want to remind you that we have victory right here in our hands. God has made us a promise. A promise that he will keep. That if we remain in Jesus... that we will one day live with our Savior and our God in heaven. I believe that's a victory. You see, Jesus said that he has overcome the world, and when we remain in Jesus and he in us, then we have that power. We will overcome the world. Peace. Well, I do not think the world is out here to offer us peace. I think you'll agree with that. Jesus also told us that in him is where we find peace. Peace belongs to Christ. It is Christ to give us that peace. And what's so encouraging is when you think about it and Christ gives us that peace, this world nor anything in it can take it away because, again, Christ has overcome the world. Victory and peace, that makes this next, these next few minutes so precious to us. The bread, the body of our Savior, we need to stop and realize that it's the sacrifice that Jesus made, the giving of this body, where he paid the price for our peace. That's the reason peace is his to give us. And he paid our debts and he freed us from bondage, the giving of his body. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for that beautiful sacrifice that Jesus was willing to give. Father, we know that it is through that sacrifice that we have hope we know that Jesus and your promise to us will come true 
Father, again, thank you for the love that was exhibited by our Savior for doing this for us. In his name we pray, amen. The cup, in this cup is the fruit of the vine, the very blood of Jesus. It is interesting, and I understand that we as humans without blood would only survive just a few minutes. Yet, this blood, the blood of our Savior, allows us eternal life. Quite a contrast. Jesus said, shed this blood for us that you and I can live with him forever. It's this blood that cleanses us and has washed away the sins and made us pure and holy. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the cleansing action of this blood. And Lord, what a blessing it is for your children this morning to together drink of this cup and proclaim to the world and proclaim to each other that Jesus Christ is the way to salvation and hope and peace. It's in Jesus' name we offer this prayer. Amen. Before we talk about giving, I have a brief comment I'd like to make. You know, it's as precious as this time that we just enjoyed being with our Savior, as precious as it, is, as it is to us, and as precious as that gift is from God to set this time up. Jesus expects us to commune with him whenever we're in struggle or when we're not. So my challenge is to you as we go through this week and as you find yourselves struggling in some form or fashion, be still, stop, talk to your Savior. That's what he wants. And do it often. And the more often that we do that, the more peace we will find within I have a question for you. Do you enjoy helping people in time of need? Well, I think I know the answer to that. And I know it's not an accident. Yes, we do. And I believe that it's the work of the Holy Spirit within us that causes us to enjoy helping those in need. Your shepherds here at this church, their primary focus is the funds that go through this church. We remember Jesus, and I remember in chapter Matthew chapter 25 when Jesus gives the parables to his disciple. Jesus is nearing the end of his life, and he gives the parables to the disciples. And in one of those parables, Jesus separates the sheep and goats. He puts the sheep on the right side and the goats on the left. Then Jesus invites the sheep to come and take the inheritance that has been prepared for them since creation. And Jesus explains to them why. He says, you fed me when I was hungry. 
You clothed me when I needed clothes. You took care of me when I was sick. You visited me while I was in prison. And you welcomed me in when I was a stranger. And the righteous, Scripture says, said, well, Lord, when did we do these things for you? And the Lord replied, when you do this for the least of these, you do it for me. So I'm a firm believer that when we help and when we give and give of our resources, the reason we feel good about that is we're doing it for Jesus himself. So as you think about giving, keep that in mind, that our gifts to the needy, and let me describe needy, yes, doing the physical things that they need, but there is another need that people in this world have. Some don't know they need. That need is for salvation. And so helping the needy, helping them in their physical ways and helping them to understand where hope and peace is found is the church's task. Let's pray. Father, we indeed are such a blessed people. We try to measure our blessings and we can't do so. And Father, our cup runneth over, and we know it is you that provide all good. So Father, help us as we give, help us as we help those who are in need, help us to make wise decisions and be good stewards. But most of all, help us to walk through that open door when the opportunity exists and take the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel, to those who so desperately need it. Thank you for allowing us the blessing to give. In his name we pray, amen. Some glad morning when, when this life is o'er, I'll fly, fly away, fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away, fly away, I'll fly away, fly away, fly away, fly away, fly away oh glory. I'll fly away, fly away in the morning when I die. Hallelujah, by and by. I'll fly away, fly away, fly away. Just a few more weary days and then I'll fly away, fly away, fly away. To a land where joy shall never end. I'll fly away, fly away, fly away. Well, are you ready for a word from God this morning? You know, we have discussed several different themes as we have navigated our way through this pandemic period. We have talked about peace, as Bobby was speaking of just a few moments ago. We've spoken about hope, and we mentioned the fact in both of those cases that we need to demonstrate peace and hope not just in times where peace is prevalent and hope is so available but in those dark bleak times where peace is hard to find and where things seem hopeless 
We also, last Lord's Day, talked about this concept of light. And we spoke about Paul being chosen as an instrument of God to be a light to the Gentiles. And we liken that to us being chosen as the church to go out and declare the excellencies and the praise of the one who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And it was in this context of the light that we looked at a number of different biblical passages. We talked about Psalm 119, verse 105, where it says, Thy word, God, thy word is a lamp to my feet, and it's a light to my path. We also cited Psalm 89 and verse 15. You'll remember this from last Lord's Day where the psalmist says, Blessed are those who have learned to acclaim you. And we talked about that being that joyful shout, that declaration of God. Blessed are those who have learned to acclaim you and who walk in the light of your presence. That's our challenge even as we think about sensing the presence of God and recognizing the power in sensing that presence of God. I hope you have your Bibles available because we're going to be searching the Scriptures this morning in a lot of different places. And the first one is going to be here in Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 41... And verse 10, this prophet, this spokesman for God says, So do not fear. Why? For I am with you. Do not be dismayed. Why? For I am your God. God himself says, I will strengthen you and I will will help you, and I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And so this morning, we're going to be drawing from some lessons we've had not too long ago and try to pull a lot of these things together. And so once again, I hope you do have your Bibles because we're going to be going from the old to the new and uh, just looking at many different references to where the power of God's presence made all the difference in the world. We alluded to Paul last Lord's Day, and we see the courage in Paul. We saw it at his conversion in Acts chapter 9 when he immediately went around and began proving that Jesus was the Messiah. We saw that courage in Acts chapter 13 when he recognized that the Jews were rejecting him and so he was going to turn to the Gentiles and be that light, that chosen instrument that God had for him in the first place. We saw that courage in Acts chapter 16 when he heard and he heeded that Macedonian call. And we traced his journey into that city of Philippi where we saw his courage once again that ultimately would land him in jail. But even in there, he was that light, singing songs at midnight, praying to God, and even helping that jailer who was lost to find his peace and to find his hope in Jesus Christ. And then when we think about the presence that Paul felt of God in his life, we see that in his courage Even later on when he's in prison in Rome and he's riding back to this church in Philippi, we alluded to that, that Tom and Keith are going to be sharing with us in our connection group study this evening. But we remember that Paul, in writing that church, would declare in verse 1, for me to live is Christ and for me to die is gain. That power of the presence of Christ in his life. So much so that he would also write in Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13, when he talks about he had learned the secret of contentment, peace, hope. He had learned that secret no matter what the circumstances were. 
And then he declared in verse 13, I can do all things through Christ that gives me strength, that power of the presence of God in his life. And really when you think about it, understanding and sensing the power of the presence of God can be found in so many biblical stories and so many biblical characters. You can go all the way back to, you remember the selection of the reluctant Moses to be God's chosen person to go secure the the freedom and the liberties of God's people out of bondage in Egypt. And Moses was reluctant until it became apparent God was assuring Moses that he would not be doing that alone, but that God himself would be with him and would give him the words to be able to say. And when we looked at that lesson not too very long ago, we mentioned the fact that if God brings you to it, he will help you through it. And he will even be there to help you do it. And you remember when Moses even asked the question, who am I going to say sent me when people ask? The answer that God gave him was that very simple answer, I am. I am. I am sent you. I am with you. And that's also reminiscent, isn't it, of the great commission that we also looked at that gave the apostles that authority to go into all the world. Remember when we cited Matthew 28 to go make disciples, teach them and baptize them and continue to teach them. And the promise that he gave at the end of that commission in verse 20 was, and I will be with you always, even to the end of the age, even to the end of the world. And then you'll remember when Moses did secure the release of God's people and they made that trek out of Egypt and uh, arrived at the Red Sea and Pharaoh changed his mind and the Egyptian army was bearing down upon God's people from one side and they're trapped with the Red Sea on the other side and so that fear returns and that confusion returns and yet you hear the words of Moses in Exodus chapter 14 verse 13. Moses answered the people, do not be afraid, but stand firm and you will see the deliverance that the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians that you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. And that reminds us of that great psalm that we're going to look at in even more detail a little bit later in Psalm 46 and verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. Sensing the presence of God provides that peace. Sensing the presence of God provides that hope. Sensing the presence of God provides that power. We see that also when the nation of of Israel gets to the promised land when the children of Israel get to the border of the promised land you'll remember that story in Numbers chapter 12 and 13 and 14 when Moses had them select a representative from each of the tribes and sent them into the promised land to scope it out and when they came back 10 came back with that negative report that while the land is filled with the milk and honey God promised It is also filled with giants that we appear as grasshoppers in their sight. There's no way they concluded that we can actually take the land. And it was only Joshua and Caleb that came out recognizing they weren't looking at the size of the giants. They were remembering the size of their God. And so in Numbers chapter 14 and verse 9, Caleb's response to the negativity Uh, of the multitude of people was do not rebel against the Lord and do not be afraid of the people of the land because we will devour them their protection is gone but the Lord is with us so do not be afraid of them he sensed the power of the presence of God What's interesting about that story as it unfolds, they listened to the negative report of the ten and were destined then to wander in the wilderness 
until that unfaithful generation would die out. But before that happened, they, they changed their mind and they wanted to go on and, and take the land. But to Moses warned them, this is in verse 42, Do not go up, it's too late now, because the Lord is not with you now. They had lost the presence of God in the sense of being able to take the land any longer. But I also want you to notice much later on when Moses was preparing the people for the time that they would go into the promised land. This is in Deuteronomy chapter 20 and verse 1 where the text says, When you do go to war against your enemies and when you see the horses and the chariots and the army that's greater than yours, do not be afraid. Because the Lord, your God, who brought you up out of Egypt, will be with you. And so time and time again, the presence of God is reaffirmed to His people to empower them. That's the same message that God would give to Joshua, who would ultimately lead God's people into the promised land. When you go over to Joshua chapter 1, and you look at verse 9, God says to Joshua, Have I not commanded you to be strong and to be courageous and don't be afraid and don't be discouraged for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And you might remember, it would just be a few chapters later in chapter 6 as they are confronted by those great walls of Jericho God assured Joshua and the people that he had already delivered that city into their hands. And who can forget the incredible courage of the young shepherd boy David in 1 Samuel when he is willing to confront the giant Philistine Goliath when no one else would. And his reasoning for his assurance of being victorious was not regarding his ability but it was regarding the power of the presence of God in his life he recognized God had delivered him from the hand uh, of the bear and the mouth of the lion God had made that deliverance available to him and surely God would deliver him from this giant and he even mentioned that in the confrontation with Goliath well it's over and over again throughout history, biblical history, that God is assuring His people there is power in sensing my presence. Going back to Paul and some of the letters that he would write, when he would write to the young preacher Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7, Paul would say this to the young preacher, the spirit that God has given to us, and we've talked about that presence of God's Spirit and that gift of God's Spirit. The Spirit that God has given to us does not make us timid. It doesn't make us fearful, but instead it gives us power and it gives us love and it gives us self-discipline. When you think about fear, and we've done a lot of different uh, presentations on uh, the paralyzing impact of fear and how fear can torment us in our life. But contrary to that, John would tell us in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 4, You, dear children, are from God. And you, just like Jesus has overcome the world, you can overcome the world because the one who is within you is greater than the one who is within the world. And then I want you to notice some of the words that John would write in that very same chapter, 1 John chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. This is how we know that we live in Him and He in us. He has given us of His Spirit, and we have seen and we testify that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them, and they in God. And so we know 
and we rely on the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. And this is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence, so that we'll have a boldness on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. And there is no fear in love because perfect love drives out fear. Fear has to do with judgment. And the one who fears is not made perfect in love. And so even throughout the New Testament, the writers try to uh, assure us of not leaning on our own understanding, not leaning on our own devices, but totally resting upon the power that we have in the presence of God. We've made allusion to Paul's writings to the Philippian brethren, and I want to do it once again in Philippians chapter 4, in verses 6 and 7. Paul simply says once again, don't be anxious about anything, don't worry about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and then that peace of God that transcends all understanding will be able to guard your hearts, and it will be able to guard your minds. And that's where the battle really is. It's within our minds, and Satan tries to do all kinds of uh, damage to our thinking processes. That's why Paul would go on in verses 8 and following of Philippians chapter 4 to tell us the things we really need to be thinking on. And even in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5, Paul would encourage the brethren there and encourage us here to bring all of our thoughts in captivity to the obedience of Jesus Christ. Well, there's a couple of other passages that I want to bring into uh, my presentation this morning just by way of reminding you, by way of assuring you of the peace and the hope and the light and the power that we have. One of my favorite passages in this regard is found in the Minor Prophet book of Micah, Micah chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. Listen again to these powerful words of this man of God as a spokesman for God. But as for me, I watch in hope for the Lord. I wait for God my Savior. My God will hear me. So do not gloat over me, my enemy. Though I have fallen, I will rise. And though I sit in darkness, the Lord Himself will be my light. That assurance, that hope, and that power. The same assurance that the Hebrew writer reminds us of in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. Speaking again for God, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can human beings do to me? I want to encourage you, if you would, to open your Bibles up, if you have not already, but turn over to the book of Psalms, and I'm going to kind of start closing out with just a uh, several different Psalms that I want you to be thinking on. We talked about God's Word can be our lamp, and it can be the light to our path, and so I want to equip you with some ever-ready batteries for your light. And it's found all throughout the book of Psalms. The first one is in Psalm 34. Just a very simple observation in this uh, 34th Psalm in the fourth verse. When the psalmist says, I sought the Lord and He answered me. He delivered me from all of my fears. Look over to Psalm 56. And in Psalm 56, verses 3 and 4, the psalmist says, When I am afraid, I put my trust in you, in God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, and I am not afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? 
Psalm 73, verses 26 through 28. Another ever-ready battery for you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish, and you will destroy all that are unfaithful to you. But as for me, listen to this, it is good to be near God. I have made the Sovereign Lord my refuge, and I will tell of all of your deeds. Psalm 94, verses 16 through 19. Who will rise up for me against the wicked? And who will take a stand for me against the evildoers? Unless the Lord had given me help, I would soon have dwelt in the silence of death. When I said, my foot is slipping, your unfailing love, Lord, supported me. When anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought me joy. Psalm 118, verses 6 and 7. The Lord is with me, and I will not be afraid. What can human beings do to me? The Lord is with me. He is my helper, and I look in triumph on my enemies. Moments ago, I alluded to Psalm 46, and I want to close out our time this morning by taking a close look at this amazing 46th Psalm. It's only 11 verses. And I want you to hear the Word of God. God is our refuge. God is our strength. An ever-present help in trouble. And therefore we will not fear, though the earth gives way and the mountains fall in the heart, uh, into the heart of the sea, and though its waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. The holy place where the Most High dwells, God is within her and she will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts His voice and the earth melts. The Lord Almighty. This is verse 7. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done. The desolations He has brought on the earth. He makes wars to cease and he in, uh, to the very ends of the earth. He breaks the bow. He shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Here's our verse from earlier. So be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. And verse 11, the Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us.